This is the second lecture in our series on global value chains and trade in value added. The first lecture hopefully set the scene um, in terms of talking about what value chains are, what the uh, development model uh, is that's based around uh, value chains. And I hope we started to get a sense of what that means for uh, policy. The other thing I hope we got a bit of a sense of is the way in which uh, trade in global value chains uh, changes the way that we think about and interpret the sort of trade data that we're all used to working with, which is the, the gross shipment trade data that comes from customs. So what I want to do in this lecture is now get into the nitty gritty of measurement. Now, this is going to be a technical lecture. If you don't have a strong background in mathematical economics, uh, some of this material uh, will be complex. Some, some of it will, will be hard to follow. What I would ask is that you, you stick with it and focus on the intuition. Um, uh, by that, I, I mean understanding uh, what we are trying to do and what the results mean, rather than the mechanics of sort of which matrix I'm manipulating at, at a given time. So I think if, if we can all tune into this uh, at our uh, different speeds and in our, in our different ways, we can hopefully all uh, get something out of it. So uh, six points that I'd like you to take away uh, from this lecture. The first one is that uh, calculating trade in value added is not straightforward. It's not simple. Um, you can get the idea, you know, when you go to the OECD website and they've, they've got this beautiful uh, Tiva interface where you can easily download data and it, it's all uh, sort of shiny and, and new. Um, it can look like this stuff is simple. It's, it's really not. The hard work is in the data, and then there's also some math uh, that goes into it. So we really have, do have to be conscious of that uh, when we use it. As we mentioned in the last class, the two basic ingredients are trade data and IO tables, which we then put together to make a multi-region uh, input-output table. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the detail of how we actually do that from a statistical point of view. I think that's something uh, that the experts from ADB are, are better uh, situated to talk about. Now, uh, algebra, sorry for, for those who uh, don't enjoy math, but uh, what I'm gonna show you is actually the simplest way of uh, thinking about trade and value added. Um, it involves uh, some basic algebra. The algebra has been known since, uh, since the, I should say the application of this algebra has been known since the 1950s. The algebra has been known much longer. Um, it takes a basic input output relationship and uses uh, a matrix called uh, the Leontief inverse. Um, and really what we're seeing is some fairly recent applications of this uh, to trade starting in, uh, in the 2000s really, but the concepts are all uh, pretty well understood. I'm going to work with a, what I call a toy model. Uh, so that's one uh, that, that is a small model that we can easily work with and I can actually sort of show you step-by-step uh, -step calculations. I think it, it helps to sort of fix ideas and give us a sense of what we're doing. And from there, we can go uh, to more complicated uh, settings. Now, to, really, to, to do this for real, to, to deploy it, um, you need some pretty good knowledge of a statistical uh, package. That's going to be Stata, R, Python, uh, or some other uh, package that you enjoy using. Um, to work with the results, uh, you can, of course, do that in a statistical package. Um, you can also do it in uh, Excel. So what I really want to leave you with is uh, point six, which is uh, current best practice. So the technique that I'm going to show you is the first one that was deployed in the literature. It's great for understanding the nature of what we're trying to do, but to deploy this in real policy work, we would actually use uh, a different and unfortunately much more complicated approach. I'll give you the, uh, the basics of that approach. Um, but all I need you to do with that is to understand uh, what it's producing. We don't need to get into uh, the, the detailed mathematics of it. Um, the beauty is that ADB and their partners have already produced a full decomposition of uh, trade in value added for the uh, ADB Asia and LAC 73 country, 35 sector uh, multi-region input output table. So what we really need to know for policy purposes is how to use this. And uh, so that's what I'd like you to take away from the last bit of the lecture and, and of course, take with you uh, to use in the empirical exercise. Okay, so what I'm going to do in uh, this lecture is really four, four things. Uh, one is to talk about the theory, 
of measuring uh, trade and value added, then I'll do an application. And then I think comes the most important part, which is making the data talk. Uh, you'll see when you open the data for the empirical exercise, uh, th there's a huge Excel sheet with a whole bunch of numbers in it. Now, uh, that's not policy work. Policy work is taking those numbers and using them to tell a story and letting your story be closely influenced by what you learn uh, from the numbers. So I want to talk about some basic tools that we can use um, to interpret these data in terms of the sorts of GBC linkages uh, that we were talking about in the first class. Then I'll finish off with uh, current best practice. Okay, the basic theory, I, I think it breaks down in, into about four steps. Uh, first, we need to consider what an input output system uh, looks like. We're gonna just do it in a single country setting. So we'll forget about trade. Many of you will have seen this, but for those who haven't, I think it's, it's good to just sort of fix ideas. Um, we'll then perform some operations on that input output system so that we can get a sense of what the operations uh, mean and, and what we might be interested in. Then we'll move into a multi-country, multi-sector framework, which is the, the multi-region input output table. And I, I'll give you a simple example of how to work with that. And then uh, we'll derive some key results uh, that make it possible to produce this uh, kind of first generation of uh, GPC indicators. Okay, so let's start off with a single country input output framework. We've got uh, two sectors in this country. Sector number one is manufacturing, sector number two is services. We're gonna consider an economy in autarky, so there's no trade whatsoever. Now, first thing we, we wanna do is just decompose the gross output of sector one. Okay, so gross output is just everything, the, the total value of what that sector produces. That's X. Okay, so X1 is gross output of sector one. We can break it down into two components. First, there's the part of gross output that is absorbed by final demand. Okay, so that's the part of sector one's output that is being consumed uh, directly. That is to say, uh, that is being purchased by consumers. That's final demand and we call it Y, okay? But on top of that, we've got input output relationships between sectors. So there is also intermediate demand and that is summarized in the first two terms of the equation. So what that is capturing is that there is intermediate input use of the output of sector one in order to produce more output of sector one. And then there is also use of the output of sector two to produce the output of sector one. Okay, so that, that's the meaning respectively of those first two terms. Now the A terms, so that A11 and A12, they tell us how much of the output from the respective sectors we need in order to produce uh, in, in a direct sense, uh, the gross output of uh, uh, sector one. So we can think of those as input output uh, coefficients. So uh, how much of the sector's output is required as intermediate inputs uh, for uh, manufacturing. Now, uh, two things to, to, to note, uh, you know, there are two terms there. So sectors uh, use their own output, but they also use um, the output of, uh, uh, of uh, other sectors. Thinking of the manufacturing and services example, think of, a, think of someone making a cell phone, okay? So that gets mapped into the electrical product sector. They use all sorts of output from that sector. So uh, circuitry, motherboards, all this sort of thing. That, that's all part of the output from their own sector that they use to produce their cell phone. But at the same time, they use services. They use design services, they use research, they use professional services, finance, all the rest in order to be able to produce their output. So all of that uh, is captured by those first two terms. Now, of course, if we can do that for sector one, we can do the same thing for sector two. So moving from left to right, we have sector two using some of the output of sector one to produce its gross output. We have sector two using some of its own output to produce its gross output. We have uh, sector two being purchased by consumers in final demand. And all of that sums by an accounting identity to the gross output of sector two. Okay, so again, we can think of that in very uh, intuitive terms. Now, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to stack those two equations one on top of the other. So you can see I've just written them down there. You'll notice that they line up perfectly. 
okay? So for those with some math training, um, this will immediately be suggesting to you that we can write it down uh, using matrix notation, and that's gonna simplify our lives a great deal. So using matrix multiplication, again, I'm not demonstrating it here. If you've got the background, you can easily verify this. We can see that the two stacked equations uh, on the top of the slide can be written down in matrix notation as AX plus Y equals X, where A, X and Y are defined as, uh, as, as, as above. Okay, so we have a square matrix for the A's, capturing all of those uh, uh, own use and cross use effects. X is a vector of gross output from each sector, and Y is a vector of uh, final demand. Now, this is the key equation for input output uh, analysis. Of course, it's beautifully simple. AX plus Y equals X. Um, it almost makes you think, what, what, what could we do with that? Well, we'll, we'll see in a second uh, just what we can do with it. Now, of course, keeping track of this gets all the more difficult. You know, to, to write down those stacked equations very simple when there's only one country and two sectors. When uh, there are lots of countries and lots of sectors, we need indices uh, to try and keep track of it. So in, in the literature, we typically use G to count the number of countries. G equals one in this case. N is the number of industries, equals two in this case. Then we know that the dimension of A, it's going to be GN by GN. So that is to say number of countries times the number of industries uh, across, and the number of countries times the number of industries down. Then X, of course, is a vector. So it's number of countries times number of industries uh, and a, a single uh, column. And the same is true for Y, final demand. Now, of course, when, when we move this to, to real data, there are some complications to, to that. But for the analytical work that we, we're going to do, uh, it, it helps to have that framework in mind. Okay, so now we can start playing with this equation a bit. I want you to start off by solving for X. Okay, nothing could be easier, right? We simply rearrange the equation and we find that X is equal to the inverse of the identity matrix minus A multiplied by Y. Okay, and we're gonna call that matrix I minus A inverse B. And that is the Leontief inverse. And it's the most important matrix in uh, this whole exercise. So now what have we got in that equation now that we've solved for X? Well, what it tells us is how to obtain the amount of final output in each sector required for a particular level of final demand, assuming that technology remains constant. Okay, so uh, you could imagine using this for planning purposes, which was actually an early sort of usage of it. Uh, we're not terribly interested in that. We're interested in using it for decomposition purposes. Now, to see why it's relevant to a decomposition, we need to go into the matrix in a little bit more detail. So what's, what's so special about it? Why, why does it have a name? You know, why, why, why is it a, a major uh, discovery? Well, if we think of matrix A, it gives us the technical coefficients or, or the input output coefficients in a very direct sense. So how much of sector one's output is directly used by sector two in producing its output? What A doesn't tell us is the indirect effects. Okay, so when sector one buys some output from sector two, sector two has to buy some output from sector one. Maybe there's a sector three, a sector five, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these knock-on effects that go all the way through the system from a small change of producing one more unit of uh, sector one's output. The Leontief inverse, amazingly, captures all of that. Okay, so it captures the full range of direct and ind indirect effects. In other words, it is the total amount of extra output by sector required by an additional unit of final demand, taking account of all of these direct and indirect linkages, but again, subject to constant technology. So why is that true? Okay, I've, I've just asserted it. You probably believe me. Um, if you want to see a proof, I'm, I'm obviously not, not going to go through the, the, the math of a, of a proof, um, but you can go to any uh, matrix algebra textbook and you can see that matrix B can actually be rewritten as an infinite series. It's the identity matrix plus matrix A plus matrix A squared plus matrix A cubed plus matrix A to the fourth and so on and so on, infinite series. And you can, so, you can show that that sum uh, converges, by the way. 
un under the conditions that, that we have uh, in this particular matrix. So A is direct in in input inquirements. A squared is input requirements taking account of direct and one step effects. A cubed is input requirements taking account of direct one step and two step effects. And we can keep going and keep going. And you can see that the sum of these things actually gives us the full set of direct and indirect effects. So it, it sort of, uh, it, it establishes that my assertion uh, uh, about the inverse actually has uh, some mathematical uh, basis to it. Okay, well, now that we've got the basic idea, uh, since we're using matrices, we can easily change the dimensions. G is the number of sectors, N equals uh, the number of, uh, sorry, G is the number of countries, N is the number of sectors. So the unit of analysis now becomes the country sector. So a given element of A summarizes input use in a particular country sector pair, let's say country one, industry six, from another country industry pair, say country 10, industry 12. And we can define those how, however we want. Um, we can split up A into parts of it that capture the use of inputs originating within a country and parts of it that originate from cross-border transactions. Okay, so uh, intermediate exports from country 10 to country one in the example that I just gave. Okay, so we, we're already seeing how we can use this in a very simple way to split out uh, domestic and foreign uh, input sourcing, which is of course uh, something that we're very interested in. Okay, now we do have to have a bit of a footnote. So how do we actually get matrix A? You know, when we look at an input output table uh, that someone supplies, whether it's ADB and its partners or whether it's one of the other sources we talked about, um, it is the matrix that they give us actually matrix A. Unfortunately, it's not. It's matrix A multiplied by vector X. Okay, so it's uh, what we call AX. So before we can do anything with it mathematically, we need to go through and do an element wise division by X. Okay, so we need to break it down to just these A uh, components. So once we've done that though, once we've divided through uh, by X, we can easily, uh, in theory at least, um, calculate the Leontief inverse matrix B. Okay, now let's think about value added. Now, how can we learn something about value added uh, from the input output table? Well, we can actually do that very simply. If you think of the sum of a row in, uh, the, uh, in the input output table, that always sums to gross output, okay? So we've, we've got uh, all of the intermediate use and the final use, and that has to sum to gross output. If we work down a column, remember that's only intermediate input use, okay? So we can do, once we've got uh, uh, matrix A, that is to say, after we've done the element-wise division by X, we can take an identity matrix and we can subtract a matrix Onto, which, uh, onto the diagonal of which we put the sums of the A's. Okay, now the sums of the A's is telling us the input use uh, in each sector. Okay, so if we put those on the diagonal, of course the identity matrix has one on the diagonal. If we subtract those two, we've got the gross output of each sector that is not accounted for by value added coming from inputs. That is to say, that's the value added of each sector itself, okay? So intuitively, that's giving us uh, the value added coefficients matrix. So then uh, we can set up an export matrix. As I said, from the setup that we've got in the input output table, uh, we've got both intermediate demand and final demand uh, broken down by country. Uh, so we can easily then separate out exports from domestic transactions. And once we've got that, we've actually solved the problem, okay? We can obtain a measure of the value added origin of gross exports by country sector by simply multiplying the value added coefficients matrix by the Leontief inverse and then by a matrix with exports on the diagonal, okay? Um, there is a paper, I've, I've got uh, that in, in uh, the, the extra reading where you can see all of this verified and, and derived in, in great detail. But for our purposes, it's this matrix TV that is the key output of the whole uh, exercise. It gives us the value added content of each country sector 
that is shipped to each other country sector. So if you think of, you remember my example from the previous lecture where I had country C, country B and country A. We talked about how the gross value trade data were not really capturing the economic nature of the transactions. Well, if we were to take that gross value trade data and an input output matrix for those three countries, and if we were to perform these calculations, we would get back the economic nature of the transactions that I described to you uh, purely intuitively. So getting this matrix requires a bit of work. It requires a bit of data work and it requires a bit of mathematical manipulation. But of course, it's only the start of the story. Once we've got all of this, we have to manipulate it and get it to tell us a bit of a story about what uh, value added trade looks like. That's how we turn a mathematical exercise into something that's relevant for policy purposes. Now we're here to talk about trade and value added. So I'm gonna focus on uh, the, the, the trade aspect of this. But I do wanna point out that uh, if we want to, we can use uh, different uh, matrices in place of uh, the value added uh, coefficients matrix. The World Bank has done an exercise called uh, LASEX, the labor content of exports, where they've uh, essentially replaced the value added coefficients with uh, labor coefficients. So that enables you to track each country sector's use of uh, labor through all of these direct and indirect uh, channels. So potentially a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, piece of work to do. Of course, there are huge data limitations as soon as we start talking um, uh, about labor markets. Um, but if you're interested, I do encourage you uh, to check out uh, what the World Bank uh, has been doing. Um, I can just add, add as a footnote, OECD has been doing some work on gender. Okay, so you can then break labor down if you have the data into uh, men and women uh, who, who are employers. And so you can see the gender content of exports as well. So there's a ton of different applications where we use basically this same approach. Okay, let's walk you through an application. Now, what I'm going to show you, uh, I will freely admit is a bit hard to follow on slides and a presentation. Um, it is all in uh, the user guide and there is code in the user guide. Now, if you have a technical background, if you're used to doing some coding, I really suggest that you work through this line by line so that you can actually see what the manipulations are that we're performing and how we do that uh, in, in uh, a mathematical or statistical uh, package. But I am just gonna quickly show you essentially what we do for a toy model. Um, the toy model here, uh, you know, obviously I don't wanna do this for 73 countries, which can have numbers all, all over the place. I'm gonna do it for three countries and uh, four sectors. The operations are exactly the same. Uh, it's matrix algebra, so if we change the dimensions, we're not changing anything uh, about the way in which we solve uh, the problem. But of course, it's all much easier to present uh, with small dimensions. So uh, that leads us to the multi-region input output table. It's a simple extension of the input output framework uh, that I mentioned before. So as I said, uh, initially we have countries and sectors instead of just sectors. But the important thing is that we can simply order them, we get all the intermediate use, we get final demand, and of course it all sums uh, to gross output. Um, then as I said, we've, we've got the difference between uh, the row sums and the column sums, which we can use to derive value added. It, exactly the same uh, problem that we were facing before. Now the exact one that I'm going to use comes uh, from uh, an, an IMF uh, working paper that I've, I've got on uh, the, the extra reading list at the end of the, uh, the presentation. Um, you can see here that they've got uh, AX. Uh, as I said, remember, an input output table doesn't give us A directly, it gives us A multiplied by X. It gives us Y and it gives us X. Okay, so everything we need is uh, in that uh, table. So step one. We need to sum intermediate and uh, final demand in order to get gross output. So we end up, remember we've got uh, uh, three countries and four sectors. So we're going to end up with a matrix that has three columns because we have final demand going to each of the three countries. And we have 12 rows because we have four times three country sector pairs. Now you can easily go through and verify from this matrix, that if you take the sum of the first row um, 
uh, if you take the sum of uh, the, the first row, you get the gross output that we're reporting here. So 1585 equals the sum of those other numbers, simply moving across uh, the AX and Y matrices, but focusing only on country one. So that's the gross output of country one, sector one, that is then shipped to country one. So step two, we're going to get a total gross output, that is to say, summing across all destinations. So you can see we can easily get that by summing uh, from the previous matrix. And uh, it makes some of our later work a bit easier if we actually then uh, repeat those sums uh, across cells within a column, I, I should say down uh, each, each column. So we're simply, as you can see, repeating uh, the number. You can easily verify that uh, the entry, the first entry 6901 is the sum of uh, row one in the previous matrix. So it's the total output of uh, country one, sector one, shipped to all destinations. So what we would call a gross output. So then remember that the first thing we need to do is to recover this matrix A. So to do that, we need to take the AX matrix, which is given to us by the IO table, and we need to do element-wise uh, division by X. Okay, so that's where it's helpful to have the AX matrix set up with those uh, repeating cells so that we can easily loop through or, or do a simple element-wise uh, operation if our, our software supports it. Um, you can again easily verify that this is a, a simple division that I'm doing uh, to get the elements of A. Now you'll notice that all of these elements are less than one. Um, that's actually important for the Leontief index, uh, Leontief inverse uh, to be well, uh, well defined, but that is always going to be the case uh, in a standard input output uh, context. So this gives us the matrix A, which is the matrix of technical coefficients. That is to say the direct input requirements for an extra unit of output in each country sector. From that, since we've got A, we can easily calculate identity matrix minus A inverse, which is the famous uh, Leontief inverse matrix uh, B. So this is now giving us the uh, direct and indirect input requirements for an extra unit of output by country and by sector. Okay, so to give you an example of what this means, to increase output of country one, sector two, by one unit, we need 0 0.241 extra units of country one, sector one's output, taking account of all direct and indirect linkages. So you can see immediately how this differs uh, from the matrix of technical coefficients, which only gives us the direct uh, input requirements. So step five then, we calculate the value added share matrix. So you remember we were taking uh, the, the column sums, subtracting those uh, from an identity matrix after putting them onto the main diagonal uh, of a matrix. Again, you can go through and uh, verify that. The interpretation of this matrix is that the value added share of total output in country one, sector one is 17%. In country one, sector two, it's 16.8%, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, then we simply calculate exports. So this is adding up uh, the elements of AX and the elements of Y where the origin country and the destination country are different. Okay, intuitively very simple. Um, we use indicators of, of different types to do that when, when we're actually implementing it in software. You can easily uh, verify this for yourself. Now again, we get 12 rows because we've got exports by uh, country sector and we're going to put each of those entries onto a diagonal uh, matrix for the next step. And that is indeed the final step. So we calculate uh, the value added uh, trade matrix. This is uh, TV, so it's the value added share multiplied by the Leontief inverse multiplied by uh, exports put on a, a diagonal uh, matrix. And this is the answer. Now, if you're a technical person, you're probably pretty happy uh, with this output. That, that's great. We've got all these fascinating numbers. If you're a policy person, you're thinking, what on earth do we do with this? Okay, we've, we've, we've got a matrix full of all these numbers. How can we possibly uh, turn that into usable uh, policy? So that indeed is the trick.
Next section, making the data talk. Okay, once you've got this matrix, maybe you feel like you've done the hard part of the job. I actually think the hard part is the next part, which is using these data to tell a story. Now, of course, you know, when I say making the data talk, I'm not talking about torturing them until they tell you what you want to hear. Okay, that's a misuse of data. What I'm talking about is to use, uh, I think, hopefully fairly simple approaches to take this pretty sophisticated piece of analysis and make it first understandable for policy audiences and second, to use it to motivate analysis and advice that can help us make better policy over time. Now to do that, we're gonna use this, uh, this matrix, the TV matrix, so the, 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 uh, the, the matrix that, that tells us about trade and value added. Um, we've talked about how to obtain it, but for policy purposes, once we've got that matrix, it's just sitting there in uh, Excel. Now, I would use a statistical package to uh, analyze. I think it makes it a lot quicker and cleaner. There's code that you can reproduce. Um, but if you work in Excel, uh, if you prefer that, you can actually do the work that we're about to describe uh, in Excel. I would encourage you to get familiar with that. Indeed, I'm asking you uh, to, to do it in a certain sense in the empirical uh, exercise. So now I'm going to work through the example results. Instead of talking about country one, sector one, I'm going to apply some names to these things. Obviously, it's not real data, okay? This is just made up uh, data that we're using for example uh, purposes, but I think it helps to put names on it uh, so that we can understand it a bit better. Okay, so this is our TV matrix uh, that we got out of the, the, the toy model, the, the three country, four sector model. Um, I've done three countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And I've done four sectors, transport, finance, agriculture, and uh, mining. So you can see we've, we've got two good sectors and two services sectors. So now, first, first question. If I take those yellow cells, okay, which is uh, something to do with the Kenya transport sector, what does their sum give us? Okay, what does the sum of those yellow cells give us? Well, verify that the sum of those cells is Kenya's gross exports of transport services. So now what we're getting a sense of is that this TV matrix is actually a kind of decomposition. Okay, so it sums the columns sum to uh, gross exports. And so each element of that is telling us about some part of those gross exports. Okay. So let's take one part of it, those red cells. You can see from the labeling that it's got something to do with Kenya. Now we know that the sum of that full column is gross exports of transport services, but what's the sum of those red cells? Well, that's domestic value added, okay, DVA. What do I mean by that? It's the value added that comes from each of the four sectors within Kenya in order to export uh, transport services. So it's the, we're decomposing uh, transport sectors into their value-added components, and we're tracking down the value-added components that originate in Kenya. Okay, so that's our domestic value-added. What about the green cells? What, what do they tell us? Well, this should be pretty intuitive now. If, it's the, if the sum of that column is gross exports, and the sum of the red cells is DVA, what's gross exports without domestic value-added? Well, in this model, it's foreign value added. Okay, so this is value added components coming from Ethiopia and Nigeria and being incorporated in, 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 uh, in Kenya's exports of transport services. Okay, so that, that again, uh, remember in the examples we were talking about in the previous lecture, we called that backward linkages. Okay, so this is use of foreign intermediate goods and services in the production of the home country's exports. Okay, trickier one now. Now, I, I have to give you a caveat uh, when I ask this question. I'm asking it for example uh, purposes, uh, but you, 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 you wouldn't uh, actually do the calculation this way for, for various reasons. But if we think about the blue cells, what are they telling us? Well, the light blue uh, cells if we were doing this in an aggregate model, so one where we only had one sector, would tell us indirect domestic value added in exports. That is to say, value added from Kenya's transport services sector that is embodied in the exports of other countries. And I, I, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It's the blue cells 
minus domestic value added. Okay, now that works if we have a one sector economy. Turns out that it actually doesn't work if we have multiple sectors. Okay, so I'm showing you as an example, but again, in, in our context where we typically have multiple sectors, um, this calculation tends to break down. So I'll show you a different way of doing it. But intuitively, we can see that this TV matrix, at least under certain circumstances, not only can it tell us about backward linkages, which I just showed you through uh, the, the uh, green cells, but through the blue cells, it can tell us about forward linkages as well. So you can see that this TV matrix is fantastically useful. It's telling us how to break down gross exports into their component parts in a way that captures the value added nature of the transactions behind what we're seeing in the customs data. Okay, so this is really, as I, as I said at the outset, what we wanted to do with that example I gave you of countries A, B, and C. So how about the pink cells? This is, this is one for the, the services folks. You, you should be able to answer this pretty easily now. Well, you can see that the, the pink cells are identifying transport and finance. So there we're saying that's total services sector value added in Kenya's exports of transport services. So the reason I like that, I work a lot on services. If, if we take a sector we're interested in, say, uh, electrical equipment, we can actually break down uh, what percentage of its gross exports is in fact uh, originating in a completely different part of the economy, that is to say the services sector. That's a really important policy point, and it's one that many policymakers completely miss. Um, so I, I think we can't make this point strongly enough that one of the things that we can do with this is to identify uh, cross-sectoral linkages in terms of uh, the nature, the economic nature of the transactions that lie behind gross exports. So uh, you can see that if we, if we can do this, there, there's any number of ways that we can start telling a story. There, there's a, a story across countries, there's a story across sectors, and there's a story through time, okay? And you can imagine looking at these shares of domestic value added, foreign value added, and thinking about how the degree of value chain integration as measured by those two things is, uh, is uh, changing over time across countries, across sectors. Okay, as I said, how you do this is a little bit up to you. You can do it in Excel. For those with the background, I do recommend using a statistics package, something like R or, or Stata or, or, or whatever you feel most comfortable working in. Okay, so for those of you with a technical background, without a technical background, what I just presented was not simple. Okay, there was a lot of challenging material in that. Alas, I have some bad news. Current best practice is actually a lot more complicated. Now, uh, part of the complication comes from the fact that uh, what I presented to you works very well in a setting where you have uh, only one sector, okay? So where you're talking about total trade, total goods and services trade. When you start adding multiple sectors, these measures start breaking down. And the one that's particularly problematic is forward linkages. It starts doing all sorts of crazy things. Um, the ratio of forward linkages to gross exports is not well behaved, that is to say, bounded between uh, zero and one. We find all sorts of inconsistencies at a very disaggregated level. The second problem uh, with this approach is that it doesn't fully identify double counting in trade statistics. So it gives us value added origin, but it's not capturing these movements of goods and services back and forth between countries multiple times. Uh, during the production process. It turns out that we can do a bit better. So there's uh, a well-known paper by uh, Wang Wei and Zhu, uh, published in 2013, uh, the, it's updated in 2018. Now they've got a, a completely rigorous decomposition of bilateral trade at the sector level. Okay, so this one enables us to decompose gross exports at the country pair sector level. Okay, so whereas what I showed you works pretty well at an aggregate level, what they're doing works really well at the level of, for instance, uh, China's exports to Korea in the electrical equipment sector. Okay, so we can break down the value added content of that bilateral sectoral export flow. And we can break it down into different types of domestic value added, different types of foreign value added, and different types of double counting. So it does give a complete 
um, decomposition. They actually, in, in the original paper, they break it down into 16 um, components. In uh, the updated paper, they aggregate those 16 components into eight components. You, you can already see that it's starting to get much more complicated uh, than the model that I, that I showed you. Here's the breakdown of the, uh, of the eight components. So you've got exports being broken down into all different sorts of domestic value added, double counting and foreign value added. Um, now, do be aware that those eight that I've got on the slide are actually aggregates of the original 16. And in the work that uh, we do in the empirical exercise, we're going to be working with the original 16, okay? because that, that's the way it's typically uh, uh, implemented in, uh, the, in the standard uh, approaches. So I'm not going to derive their decomposition in, in detail. It is technically complex. Um, even if you have a good background, uh, it takes a lot of working through uh, to get a handle on it. I do go through it in a lot more detail in the user guide. I show you some code, uh, some Stata code. I, I should say uh, Stata is incredibly slow at doing these operations. So I, I did the work in Stata um, because I think it's very transparent. Um, I, it, it still tends to be the most commonly used uh, software. Um, doing it with a toy model is fine. Um, if you try doing this with real data, uh, you'll be waiting forever. So I'll talk about uh, an easier and quicker uh, way of, of doing this uh, at the end of the presentation. So the way these guys set up their decomposition, they think about three countries, S, R, and T. And from that, you can define a global Leontief matrix, which is matrix B. And it's made up of all these different components. So basically, you have a bit of the Leontief that's talking about input use from country S by, uh, by uh, producers in country S. Then you have all the cross linkages between S and T, between R and S, between S and R, and between R and T. All of this is directional, okay? So the global Leontief should be familiar, but you can then break it down into all these different sub matrices. Okay, and you can see there, I've, I've written down uh, the, the, the country-wise sub matrix, for uh, the Leontief between S and R, going directionally from S to R. Then they derive what they call the local Leontief matrix. So the matrix is L, and it's made up of different bits of all these sub-matrices uh, with uh, zeros on the off-diagonal uh, elements. Okay, so those are the ingredients. We then use some of the standard ingredients from what I just showed you, to produce the decomposition. Now, th this, is, uh, this equation takes a, a lot of time uh, to really understand. The first line is fine, okay? We've got exports from S to R being made up of domestic value added, foreign value added, and pure double counting, okay? That makes perfect uh, intuitive sense. The problem starts when we, when we uh, start wanting to calculate domestic value added. I'm not, I'm not even gonna walk you through all of the terms in that equation. Um, you can, all, all you need to know is that it's technically complex and the way that these guys have done it is completely rigorous. Okay, so it gives us a breakdown where all of the measures are well behaved and they completely account uh, for gross exports. Um, I, I've put up the, the equations here for foreign value added and pure double counting. Again, I'm not going to go through them. Um, if you have the technical background, I do recommend both the user guide and uh, the original paper to try and uh, get some sense out of that. So uh, programming this, as I said, is non-trivial. Um, you're not going to want to do it yourself. Uh, the easiest way to do it is with a package called Decomp R, uh, which is available in uh, R, the, the statistics package. Um, very simple to implement. It takes some elements of uh, the multi-region input-output table. Uh, it performs the magic, and it gives you the full 16-term decomposition from the original 2013 paper. If you have a technical background, please go ahead and, and uh, do that. It's quite straightforward. Um, if you don't have a technical background, uh, don't worry. For the work that we're going to do, ADB has already done this work for you. So they've produced the 16-term uh, decomposition. And so what we want to do, and what I ask you to do in the empirical exercise, is to aggregate those 16 terms into the major components, by which I mean domestic value added, foreign value added, and pure double counting. And then I want you to look just at those three components and start to tell a story that's relevant for policy analysis. It can be looking at 
uh, differences in GBC integration across sectors and how that might relate to trade policies or other policies. It can be looking at changes through time and how that might relate, for example, to a trade agreement, okay, where we would expect to see some deepening of uh, GBC linkages. There's no limit, really, on the sorts of policy stories that we can start to tell. And ADB, uh, thankfully, has made it very easy for us uh, to get in and actually do the interesting uh, policy work. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this uh, pretty technical uh, lecture. If you've got the technical background, again, please do go as far as you can uh, with this material. I think the better you understand it, the better you'll be able to work with it. If you don't have the technical background, please just focus on the intuition. What are we doing with, with, with all this uh, number crunching and mathematics? All we're doing is what I showed you with those three circles, countries A, country B, and country C. All we're trying to do is, is get from the gross value trade statistics to some sense of how value added actually moves in the economy, okay? So the WWZ decomposition, which is current best practice, gives us a rigorous decomposition of gross exports into its value added components, we can aggregate it into, into three major categories, domestic value added, foreign value added, and pure double counting. The sum of two of those, foreign value added and pure double counting, gives us a good indication of the degree of global value chain uh, integration uh, that a country sees. We can also use one of the domestic value added categories called DVA interacts to give us a measure of forward linkages. That's giving us a direct measure of uh, the proportion of my country's exports that are shipped out and used as intermediates elsewhere to produce their own uh, exports. So uh, that brings us to the end of the session. In the next lecture, I'll show you a practical application of all of this that's focused on the policy question of trying to better understand GBC linkages between Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's using uh, the, the data produced by ADB and its partners, and it's trying to tell a bit of a policy story. So again, if the technical material was something that you found really challenging, I think just try and keep the basics in mind, and hopefully the next lecture will crystallize some of the ideas and show you exactly uh, what it's possible to do with this. Then of course, all of you uh, will be uh, getting your hands on this yourselves, uh, when you come to the empirical exercise. So I look forward to continuing this discussion with you then.